We all know that after his resurrection, Jesus ascended and went back to his father. But can you imagine what his report might have been to the father after his 33 years sojourn here on earth? Well, that's what we've been talking about over these past several weeks in this new mini series. I guess it's not new now. This is the last version of it, the last lesson. Vene vidi vici. Vene vidi vici. I came, I saw, I conquered. The praise report of the risen Lord. Praise the Lord. This is Dr. C. Dexter Wise III, and welcome to TNT. TNT stands for Tuesday Night Teaching, and it's Tuesday night, so guess what I'm doing? I'm teaching. And whether you're joining us from across the street, across the city, across the country, or across the continent, we're glad to have you. This would be a great time for you to share. Tell somebody that we are on the air and we about to close this series out in a great fashion. There are notes to this TNT series and if you have missed the past two lessons, it's only three lessons to this mini season, uh, mini series. And so there are three lessons, we've already done two. You can go to the church website at faithministries.church look at the uh, menu the menu that says grow click grow and there'll be a drop down click tnt and at the bottom of that you will see the notes to these lessons now these lessons have blanks in them so you'll have to listen to what i'm talking to you about on tuesdays or review the videos to fill in the blanks okay so you got the notes you got the tnt lessons and then on sundays We'll be preaching on this same passage. And then right after that, we have the Faith AC groups that meet and discuss and talk about those respective lessons and the sermons that have come as a result of them. So you got all kinds of ways of getting this message. And we hope that if you don't get it one way, you'll get it another way or all the ways and get the full benefit of these lessons. Okay, so here's our series, Vene Vidi Vici. Those are the three words that Julius C Caesar used when he summarized a battle that he had won. I came, I saw, I conquered. It's Latin. And uh, we are suggesting that had Jesus gone back to his father and his father had asked him, well, how did it go? How did, how did you do down there on earth? What, what was the story? Summarize what happened that Jesus could use the same words that Julius Caesar said, I came, I saw, I conquered. Okay, got it? Let's bow for a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you once again for giving us the privilege to come before you as you have so many times. Now, God, do it again. Don't just let us come before you. Come alongside us and with us. Join us in these discussions, in these deliberations, that we might understand you and having understood you might be better able to represent you. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake. Amen. Okay, this is the third lesson of a three lesson series. Vene Vidi Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered. This is the post resurrection report of the risen Jesus Christ. So the first lesson we said, I came, we talked about Jesus and his coming, the importance of his coming. Thank God that he came. He didn't have to come, but he did come. Secondly, the last time we said, I saw, I saw. So he came and what did he do? When he came here, he saw some stuff. And not only did he see some things, but he reacted to those things. And as he reacted to those things, he did something to change those things. So he was not just a spirit that came to earth and started spooking around seeing stuff but he was a a spirit who became flesh and once in the flesh saw things in the flesh about people of flesh that uh, caused him to react to those things so he interacted he he interacted he reacted he acted he became a part of what he saw so he could say like Julius Caesar I came I saw but here's the big the, the real deal if he came and he saw and just said, so what? But he came, he saw, and he conquered. And that's what we're talking about. And that's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. Not just that he came, 
not just that he saw, but that he conquered. It's the conquering that we celebrate on Resurrection Sunday, and it's the conquering uh, that is the reason why he came in the first place. You had to have those things before he could get there. He had to come before he could conquer. He had to see before he knew what to conquer, but praise God, he did conquer. So let's get right into our lesson here, this first section that says, How I Conquered. How I conquered. I conquered vicariously. Wow, that's a great big word, vicariously. I conquered vicariously. And what that means is that I conquered not just for me, but I conquered for you. And I didn't just conquer for you, I conquered in your place. Lord have mercy. I conquered in your place. So when I died, I didn't just die for me, but I died by taking your place. You should have been on the cross. You should have been the one sacrificed. You should have been the one whipped. You should have been the one that, that, that bled. But because I did it vicariously, I substituted my death for yours. I substituted my blood for for yours. I substituted my pain for yours. That's what vicariously means. And so the, the, the conquering that Jesus did was such a, a powerful conquering that 2,000 years ago, the death he died on that cross took my place 2,000 years later. I wasn't even born. So that, that's a major, that's a major, major conquering. He conquered in my place. He took my place on the cross. Can, can somebody just shout right there? Can somebody just praise the Lord for that? That he conquered vicariously. He substituted his death for mine. I conquered vicariously. Here you see in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one that died, but we get the victory. That's vicarious conquering. Number two there, I conquered unconventionally. I conquered unconventionally. Well, how, how was his death uh, and his conquering unconventional? It was unconventional because he conquered death by dying. That don't make no sense, but that's what he did. He conquered death by dying. He was a king, but he did not have an earthly throne. He was a king and uh, he was subject even to Pilate. Pilate. He stood before Pilate and Pilate said, don't you know that I have the power to take your life? He said, no, you don't have the power to take my life. I'm laying it down. He conquered unconventionally. That's why many people did not believe in him. He can't be a king. How can he be a king? He's up on the cross. How can he be a king if he's being crucified? But his conquering was unconventional. John 19 verses 16 through 19 says, then they delivered him, then he delivered him, that is the, the soldiers delivered him to be crucified. Then they took Jesus and led him away. And he, Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of a skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him one on either side and Jesus in the center. Now Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He conquered unconventionally. It wasn't the way people were expecting him to conquer, but he did conquer unconventionally. And then I conquered completely, completely. Not just vicariously to substitute for other people, not just unconventionally so nobody saw it. But by the time I got finished conquering, I conquered completely, not halfway, not partway, not partially. I conquered completely. And uh, we see this here in Matthew 28, verses 16 through 18. Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain which Jesus had appointed for them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. There it is right there. All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So my conquering is so complete that it covers everything everything in heaven and everything on earth. So, so how did I conquer? I conquered vicariously. I took your place. I conquered uh, not only vicariously, but I conquered uh, completely in terms of I was able to be able to have authority now 
over heaven and over earth. And then I conquered unconventionally in a way that people did not expect, but was effective in the end. Okay, that's how I conquered, said Jesus. Now, what did I conquer? What, what did Jesus conquer when he conquered after he came and he saw? I conquered, here's uh, verse number 50. This is coming from 1 Corinthians. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 58. And this gives us the broad, big picture of the conquering that Jesus did. I conquered. What else did you conquer, Jesus? I conquered temptation. I conquered temptation. We see this in Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. And let me just go ahead through the record and share this with you. I'm sure you're familiar with the passage, but let me get it in the record, talking about him conquering temptation. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterwards when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. But Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, taking him on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me, and I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. And Jesus answered and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is also written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all their ways, to keep you in their hands. They shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Now when the devil had emptied, Ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. I conquered temptation. Now, before we leave this, I do want to say this, that temp being tempted is not a sin. Because if it were, then Jesus would have sinned in being tempted. Being tempted is not a sin. It's whether you yield to the temptation. And that's how he conquered temptation. He was tempted at least three times by the devil in the wilderness, and he did not yield to that temptation. It's interesting. You note that he was tempted by the devil in the wilderness. He wasn't on. Uh, he wasn't in Las Vegas. He wasn't in the club. He was in the wilderness. He was all by himself. And even there, you can be tempted. And even though he was tempted while he was by himself and wasn't nobody looking, wasn't nobody there but the devil, he did not submit. He did not yield. He did not uh, fall into temptation, but he conquered temptation. And so that's part of the victory that we see that he has won. He's shown us that you can conquer temptation. I conquered temptation. What else did you conquer, Jesus? I conquered critics. 
I conquered critics. Jesus seemed to draw them because everywhere he went, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees, they just tagged along just to be, you know, like those two little guys in the Muppets, those guys who sit up in the balcony just criticizing everything. That's, he had that crowd following him everywhere he went. But every time he was able to conquer the critics. I love this line here in Mark chapter 12, verse 34. Now, when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he had asked the Pharisee a question. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God, but after that, no one dared question him. So he was in this little discussion with these, uh, these uh, critics, and uh, he answered them so well that they were scared to ask him another question. They didn't question him anymore. That's how much he conquered them. He was able to come back to the critics and bring them an answer that made them silent. And uh, that's something that the Lord does to you and he'll do for me. And that is that when we are opposed, that when we are challenged, that God will put words into our mouth that will silence the critics. Jesus said, I conquered the critics. Then in John 16, 33, he says, I conquered the world. Not just the critics, but I conquered the world. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So when I came, when I saw, I conquered everything I saw. I conquered the whole world. Not just the planet, but I conquered the stuff on the planet. I conquered the evil systems on the planet. I conquered the, the, the principles and the practices that were against God. I conquered the world. And so you live in this world, Jesus said, and as you pass through this world, you're going to have tribulation. But I need you to know that the tribulation that you are experiencing in the world is not as bad as it could be because I have overcome the world in which the tribulation is. Is, exists. Okay. So you're in the tribulation, the tribulations in the world, but I've overcome the world. I conquered the world. Praise God. Then I conquered death. I conquered death. Verse 54 of that passage that we read earlier in uh, 1 Corinthians 15. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? Death is swallowed up in victory. Jesus had the victory over death by dying. And by dying, he had that victory and it was swallowed up. He got the victory. And uh, when it says the sting of death is taken out because we're not afraid of death anymore because Jesus has conquered the death. And by him conquering the death, he gave us the victory over death. What else did you conquer, Jesus? I conquered hell. I conquered hell. Back to this same uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 55 says, O Hades, O hell, where is your victory? Let's skip over to Ephesians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. And uh, here we see where uh, we are told that Jesus, when he went to hell, he didn't just go there, but he had a mission when he went there as well. Verse number seven says, but to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended. What does it mean but that also he first, or that he also first descended into the lower parts of earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens that he might fill all things. So what Paul is saying in Ephesians is that we know that Jesus ascended into the heavens after he died, but before he ascended, he descended. You can't ascend unless you descended first. So he's saying he descended in the lower parts of the earth. That's hell. And when he went down there, he led captivity captive. In other words, he went down there and just as he, he, he conquered death by dying, he led captivity captive by going into the lower parts of the earth and liberating those persons who had been captivated in all those years up to his coming. He had a revival down in hell. And you know, there's a passage 
passage in Matthew that says that after his resurrection, the graves opened and people who had been dead came out of the graves. Why? Because they had been liberated even in the lower parts that Jesus had gone down to. What else did you conquer, Jesus? I conquered the grave. I conquered the grave. And that's the whole point of this Resurrection Sunday, that Jesus not only died and went to hell, but the grave that has held so many all the way up till him could not hold him. The stone was rolled away. And when the women came to the tomb, they found that the tomb was empty. Jesus was gone because he had conquered the grave. And so here in Jesus, we see Jesus coming and he dies on the cross, but his victory is not just on the cross, but his victory is over death. His victory is over hell. His victory is over the grave. And all three of those things that have been making us tremble and yet causes us to tremble need not do that because we have a conqueror who took our place and conquered all three of them for us. That's, that's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. That's why we get excited because when he got up, we got up. When he rose, we have the potential to rise. And so we celebrate that we do not have a dead savior, but we have a living savior who conquered all of those things in the past, but those things he conquered in the past continue to have benefits for us in the present. And then finally, I conquered, says Jesus, sin and the consequences, the eternal consequences thereof. I conquered sin and the eternal consequences thereof. Mark chapter 10, verse 45 says, for even the son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. He conquered sin. The ransom means, you know, somebody if somebody's kidnapped, you have to pay some money to get them back. Well, that's what happened. We were in sin. We were in hock, if you will. And so when Jesus died, his blood paid the price to get us out of hock and to get us back in a right relationship with God. And so what he did once and for all on Calvary paid that price for us and has eternal consequences for those who believe in him. And so as we approach this Resurrection Sunday, as we approach this, this Easter, if you will, we thank God that he sent a Savior who came willingly. We thank God that he sent the Savior that once he came, he saw. And then once he saw things, he conquered those things that would keep us separated from God. So we know Julius Caesar was a famous and great general. He was a famous and great Caesar, but he's no greater than our Jesus Christ. Christ, because if Julius Caesar came, saw, and conquered, it's nothing like what Jesus did. He said, I came, I saw, I conquered, and I don't know about you, but I'm mighty glad that he did. Let's look at these questions here for reflection and discussion. Number one, in what way can it be said that Jesus conquered death, hell, and the grave? Number two, how did Jesus conquer sin even though we continue to sin? Number three, what does the fact that Jesus has given us the victory mean for how we should live our lives? And number four, since Jesus has conquered so much, how does that make us more than conquerors? Okay, you got it? Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we thank you today for another chance to talk about you, but we thank you even more for another Resurrection Sunday where we can celebrate all over again that you conquered. You conquered death. You conquered hell. You conquered the grave. And you didn't just do it so you could beat your chest and say, look what I did. You did it for us. You did it in our place. You did it in our stead. That's why we love you. That's why we praise you. That's why we celebrate you. God, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, that's it for this portion of the lesson. I'm going to step away, but don't you step away. I'm going to step away, but I'll be right back. When we come right back, let's, let's celebrate our resurrected Lord. Let's celebrate the fact that he didn't just come, but he saw. He didn't just see, but he conquered. And now he stands, and indeed he may sit at the right hand of the Father, and says, I came, I saw, I conquered. Praise the Lord. I'm going to step away. Don't you step away. I'll be right back.
Okay, we're back, we're back, and we're talking about Jesus, uh, trying to give the big picture of what he did during his ministry here among us. And uh, the big picture is he came, that was a big deal, he got here. And after he got here, he saw some stuff, he changed some stuff, and then he died, conquering the stuff that he saw, and therefore went back to heaven. So basically, he came, he saw, he conquered. That's the big picture. We just divided it up into three pieces just for the sake of uh, convenience for discussion. But this is what he did, this is how he did it, and uh, to God be the glory. So I hope that this has been helpful to you to kind of break up his ministry so that we could get it uh, together in various pieces. I wonder if you have any questions about that as we talk about uh, tonight. We talked about his conquering the various things that he conquered or any other other portions that we had about I came, I saw, I conquered. Okay, Steve-O, could God in Jesus' body feel our pains, temptations, and frailty? Well, that's a good question. God could feel it only to the extent that Jesus felt it. And uh, Jesus felt it while he was in the flesh. And to that extent that he was God, God felt it. But uh, I don't believe that God uh, reduced all of God to Jesus and felt it. And God felt it that way. In other words, Jesus felt it as a person. But that uh, did not distinguish uh, God from being able to feel it, if that makes sense to you. So uh, God only felt it to the extent that Jesus did. So I saw a picture years ago, a Norman Rockwell picture of a, uh, I don't know if you remember who Norman Rockwell is, but he uh, did a lot of paintings back in the 50s. And it was a picture of a uh, man in the doctor's office with his son. And his the doctor was giving the son a needle and the little boy was getting the needle and took it pretty much in stride, but the father was making a face like it was hurting him. And uh, I guess that would kind of answer your question. So Jesus got the needle, but Jesus felt it. God felt it only to the extent that it was going in his son. He felt, felt it for his son, even though he did not feel it himself. Does that make sense? Hope so. Anybody else got a question about this notion? Okay, Miss Deborah Foreman, there you go. What does hell really mean? Are there two divisions in hell, a side of judgment, and then Hades where Jesus went and released the captives? Well, part of the problem with that, Deborah, is that the word Hades and the word hell had a an evolution, if you will, across time. And there were times uh, in ancient times when Hades was just thought of as a place where dead people went. Well, what, what happens when you die? You go to the place of the dead. Okay, And then that place of the dead became a place or became thought of as a place of not just a place of where you go when you die, but a place of punishment if you don't live right. And so that's why it seems like sometimes we don't know whether we're talking about just a place where dead go, people go or just a place where punish, uh, you get punished for not living right. And so it's not that it's two divisions of hell. It's just that there is an evolution in the uh, understanding of hell and Hades. And that's why it looks like it's so uh, so divided. That's a good question. And of course, that 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 already makes even more problems because then it asks the question, okay, so what happens to the people who don't go to hell when they die? Uh, then, then, then you come up with this purgatory thing where they're kind of in the middle until they get their self right. So it's it can be very confusing. But mo most of it is based on the fact that there was an evolution in the understanding of what happens to people when they die. Do they simply just go to a place where all dead people go? Or do they go to a place where bad dead people go? And that's a place of punishment. That's where we end up in the New Testament, that hell is not just a place where people uh, who die go. It's a place where people go and are captives because they are punished. When Jesus goes down there, there are people who were there during the definition of going to the place of the dead, not because you did anything wrong, but that's, that's where dead people go. Those are the people that he brought out and uh, delivered them from that captivity. I hope that helps. I hope that helps. Another question. Dr. Jason, is there anything left for Christ to conquer? Well, there's nothing left for Christ to conquer but there's something left for us to conquer in his stead. Uh, let me put it this way. Um, there are many battles, uh, many wars that have had decisive victories 
And once the victory was won in that battle, pretty much the, the war was over. But the battles were not over. There continued to be fights. There continued to be skirmishes. There continued to be uh, conflict, even though the decisive battle has been won and fought. And so that's what happened on Calvary. That's what happened with the Revelation. The decisive battle in this war has been fought and won. Everything after that is clean up. Everything after that is the fallout from that. And so we continue to fight. We continue to have battles, but the war is pretty much all over. Let me give it to you this way. Um, let's say, for example, we're playing a football game and the score is 35 to 37. Okay, 35 to 37. And your team has 37. I say my team has 37 because I want to win. So my team has 37. Okay. Well, uh, they have 37, and uh, I have 37. Your team has 35. Well, they're like 10 seconds to go in the game, and your team is on the your own five yard line. So now you got to go 95 yards. You got 10 seconds to go, and you got to either get a, 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 a field goal or a touchdown to win. Well, on the sidelines, nine times out of ten, with ten seconds to go, you got 95 yards. The people are already celebrating. They're jumping up and down. Because based on the progression of the game, the game is pretty much over, and we've already won. And so what I'm saying is that what Jesus did on Calvary is that he made the victory so decisive that even though there's still tackling to be done, even though there's still passes to be passed and, and uh, runs to be run, the score is pretty much such that he's already won the game, even though there's still some game. We got to run the clock out. We got to finish regulation, but the game has already been won. So to answer your question, does Christ have to conquer anything else? Well, no, not technically, because what needs to be conquered has already been conquered for him to win. But there are still things that have to be dealt with still things that have to be faced as a result of what he has conquered so it looks like we have to continue to fight even though the battle that the victory has already been won still got battles but the war has already been won that's a good question any other questions about this conquering of christ sister deborah murph good to see you who did jesus deliver from hell he delivered all the people from hell who had not heard the gospel before he was born. Now don't forget, uh, the gospel is uh, what liberates you and restores you back to God. And so, of course, if God uh, condemns people to hell who don't receive the gospel, it's not fair to condemn people to hell who never had the opportunity to receive the gospel. And so Jesus went back, gave the opportunity to people who had not yet heard the gospel to hear the gospel, and those who received it, he led them back out of captivity. So that's who he led out of the people who had not yet heard the gospel because they were born, as Paul says, out of time. They were born before the gospel existed in the form that we know it. So he went back and said, okay, all you guys that missed, the, missed this revival, I'm going to give you a repeat. He gave them a repeat. Y'all want to come with me? Y'all come on with me. That's who he led out of hell. All right. So when Jesus came and he conquered, when are we going, when we are going through our trials and tribulations and we feel like we can't do it, how do we keep the strength that Jesus had? Well, uh, we keep the strength that Jesus had by uh, leaning on him and allowing his Holy Spirit to dwell in us. That's how we get his strength, by him being in us by the Holy Spirit taking over us. Uh, he did say that in this world you will have tribulations, so don't, don't, don't front. You are gonna have some tribulations, you are gonna have some trials, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world, but not only have I overcome the world, I've given you something called the Holy Spirit that will strengthen you as you go through it. So I'm not gonna leave you, I'm not going to abandon you, I'm gonna walk with you all the way so that I will empower you when you face these situations. So it's, uh, you're not Christ, I'm not Christ, none of us are Christ, but the Christ in us, the Christ in us is able to strengthen us when we're weak and uh, when we feel like we can't go on. So that's what you do 
When you feel like your strength is failing, rely on the strength of Christ in you. The more you read, the more you study, the more you pray, the more you worship, the more Christ you get uh, inside of you. And that's the Christ that you draw on when you need it. That's why I tell people sometimes if you listen to a sermon and doesn't seem like it has anything to affect your life right now, just, just put it in the bank because there'll be a time when you may have to draw on it and you'll need it uh, in days to come. So that's, that's the way that works. Draw on the strength of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. Another question. Okay, we've been rolling right along, rolling right along. Um, I'm looking forward to this week. I had a couple of days on Thursday. We have our seven last words. Then on Saturday, we have our uh, spring celebration, Easter, uh, egg extravaganza. And then on Sunday, we have at seven o'clock our early morning worship. And then at 10, our glorious uh, resurrection Sunday worship. So it's going to be a great weekend. It's already started. It started on Sunday. It's carrying on tonight and will be going throughout the weekend. So if you can, don't miss any of it. If you can, get all of it in person. If not, get what you can online. We don't want you to miss it and we don't want to miss you. Okay, that's it for now. We're going to sign off now. We'll see you on uh, the next time we see you. God bless you.